All right, good morning. Good morning. Um, I don't want to say beautiful day. Um, bring you around the corner. <laughs> bring you around the corner. Like today, like, like ever since February, it's been feeling like it's been spring. It's spring already for some reason. Yeah. My favorite to eat in the whole time. <laughs> haven't seen it yet but um, we got a lot of challenge including the school <laughs> so your next exam I think is the two weeks from now 19. So, uh, yeah. so I'm, I probably next week I'm on Tuesday I will give you the study guide like a little bit earlier after that you're gonna have a spring break right <laughs> um, wait that's the only break that you have left uh, in this full semester. So. <laughs> um, actually, the spring, spring break is from the 30th to the 1st. Yeah, the, the, the spring semester, we only have like one holiday and then the one break. That's it. Um, okay, so what we are trying to do today is uh, we're going to review what we did last week. Uh, I'm going to finish up the, uh, the matters and uh, especially about the fluid and the liquids. Um, there's a, like some very important uh, concept that we talked about last week. I want you all understand about that. Then uh, we will move on to the new topics for today, which will be about thermodynamics. So we're going to change our subjects today. What's that? The 19th. The 19th. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, so let's read something. <coughs> One question last week as well, which I haven't answered you yet, so we will explore a little bit about what should be the answer for the cross chain. Talk about a lot of things actually last. Um, the first thing we did is we defined the pressure. So the pressure we define in two different ways. Anybody remember how we define the pressure? What is it related to? Force and uh, volume. Um, not the volume, but you're close. It's going to be the force, force through the area. Yeah, the force over the area. Okay, it's the how big the force apply to what amount of the space and that is what we define as the pressure but we also have another way to define pressure which is that how much of the things above you is related to the pressure right so what is the definition for that Anybody remember? Um, I think it's n n over m squared uh, that's the unit of this It's the uh, something about tackle, <coughs> the depth, right? Depth times density. Yeah. This density is the density of the fluid. So if you think about 
we talk about the air pressure, and I told you the air pressure is this much a month, right? This is like 14.7 uh, pounds per inch square. That's how much of the air pressure is coming from. So, and that means any air before, <laughs> any air above you is where the air pressure is coming from. So one cubic meter of the air weigh about 2.5 pounds. 2.5 pounds. So if you think about this as a 14.7 pounds, so then you think about how much of the uh, cubic meter of the air above you is the air that give you an air pressure. Okay. Most of the air is within like 10 kilometer uh, above the ground. And if you go like mountain hiking or you climb a mountain, uh, if you go over like a thousand uh, feet, then uh, maybe over, uh, more, more than that, then you have to be prepared because the air will be less and less as you go higher and higher. Um, so most of the air surrounding us is within like 10 kilometer uh, range. Um, so this is the, the pressure. Now the pressure is the reason why you have a buoyant force. When we talk about float and sink, an object in a fluid, whether you are going to float or it's going to sink, it depends on two forces. So what are the two forces that you can think of that will determine whether things are going to float or sink? Density. Uh, force, I'm talking about force. Uh, What is the force that you're always going to have if you have a mass? Gravity. Gravity, which is the weight. So if you have a mass, you're going to have a weight, and that's due to the Earth. And there's another thing that will make you flow, that's what we call the buoyant force. So, if we use a tank and we fill this tank with water in there, and we put an object into this tank, <laughs> okay. So this object is in the tank and is float, right? It's float. Um, and it stay there, stay in the water, it doesn't move, which means if things doesn't move, if you think about the Newton first law, it tells you, when things doesn't move, then there is an equilibrium. The equilibrium is because the force, summation of the force, or the net force is equal to zero. And we only have two forces acting on this object, one is the weight, and the direction of the weight is going, going down. This is a weight. You have another force, which is the force which you outwards, and that's the force of the buoyant force. Right? To make it stay, to make this object stay, you have to have these two forces or equilibrium, which means this has to be equal. Okay, if this is an equal, then can you tell me what is the buoyant force equal to? It's equal to the weight. an object which is float on top of the fluid, that means the weight is equal to your buoyant force. Okay. So that's how, how we, how we uh, determine the buoyant force. What about the things that is not float, is sink to the bottom?
What are the force acting on this block? The weight. The weight. You have both weight of the block. And do you have a buoyant force? Yes. You also have a buoyant force. As long as you are in the fluid, you're going to have a buoyant force. The buoyant force is due to the difference of the pressure because the depth is going to give you a depth difference going to give you the buoyant force. So it's only have these two forces, but how can this one sink? This is also two forces, right? This is also two forces. Why would this one flow and why would this one sink? So it, the, the force push it down is the weight. The buoyant force is push it up. If you want to make this one sink, the weight has to be larger than the buoyant force so you will sink. Mm -hmm. Right, so that means the weight is larger than the buoyant force. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you have a buoyant force that is less than the weight, it will sink. So that's how we determine whether things will be flow or will be sink. So when, will the buoyant force ever be greater? Because if you think about it, just weight and weight must be equal to each other. So like mm -hmm. buoyant force will never ever be greater than the actual object, right? Or it, it can be. Yeah. If, so we can think about this, what happens if the buoyant force is greater than the weight? It will make it go out of the water because the force is pushing it outwards, the weight is going downwards, which means this force is larger than the weight. And one possibility is it's going to be, it's not going to fly away. Well, unless you push it, yes, it's impossible. Like uh, you, you push a balloon and into the water and you release your hand, the balloon will fly away, right? It will go up and it will fly away. So that means your buoyant force actually is larger than the weight of the balloon. Uh, another possibility is that you know, it can also stay on top of the water. And that is another force that we haven't talked about in this case. If this one stay on the bottom of this water tank, uh, weight is larger than the buoyant force, uh, then they are not balanced. That means it should still going downwards, but it doesn't because the tank is going to give us support, and that's what we call a supporting force. So actually, in this case, you have a supporting force from this tank as well to make it up the difference of these two. So that's the uh, main concept about things will flow or things will sink. It's all just based on the competition of these two forces. Um, any questions about this part, this topic? Now the next one, Archimedes principle is also related to this. So the Archimedes principle tells us the buoyant force is equal to the water or any of the fluid to displace.
So it's equal to the weight of the displaced liquid. Displaced the liquid. So if you if you put a block in this tank, uh, whatever the the volume of the the block, let's say this block over here, put into the tank. If you can calculate how big this block is, then that is the water to be displaced, right? And if you weigh that, it's not weighting this object, but you weigh the, 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 the volume of the liquid that you displaced, that amount is the buoyant force. That amount is equal to the buoyant force. So if you sink two objects, let's say, I have one object like this, I have another object like this, this one has a larger volume, this one has a smaller volume, they both sink into the, the, the liquid, like this tank, then this one has a larger buoyant force than this one has. Because this one displays more of the liquid in the water, okay? So if you displace more, that means you're gonna have a more buoyant force. Displace less, you're gonna have less of a buoyant force. So like the more volume it has, the more it'll float up. Is that what you're saying? More of the volume displaced mm -hmm. has more of the buoyant force. The buoyant force is depends on the volume to be displaced by the object. We can think about another situation in this case. So think about you have a cargo ship and it's in the ocean. So the water line represents how deep this, this boat is actually carried, right? If the boat has more of the weight, it's going to sink down more. When it sinks down more, it's going to displace more of the sea water, right? So th that means more of the volume under the water that is going to displace more of the water. Um, so if you don't have any of the cargo in on this uh, ship, then your water line probably is at this level. Now, if you put more things If you put more of the weight on the ship, what happens is this water line will go up. That means you displace more of the volume. And to make this one float, so this one has less weight, this one has more weight, right? Are they all float? They all float, right? What happens if they float? What is the buoyant force when they float? They were equal to the weight. So this has a last weight. And this has more weight. Last weight meaning uh, you have less of the buoyant force, right? More weight, you're gonna have more. And this one displays less of the water, this one displays more of the water. So I can make this principle just tell you, <coughs> depends on how much water you displaced. And that, that weight of the water to be displaced is equal to the buoyant force. Well, in this case, it's actually the seawater, but um, seawater will be heavier than the fresh water. Okay? Question about this part? Right. Now, if you understand this, then let me just draw the picture of the question that I, I asked you last night at the end of the class. tank like this, and this is where the water is, uh, we have three objects.
flux in the water, they have a different mass and they at a different position. This one sinks down to the bottom, this one is floating, this one is also floating, but this one is 50 kilogram, this one is the 40 kilogram. If, if these three things happen to have the same body, okay, now, what is the buoyant force on each one of the block? Would they be the same or would that be the different? If they, this one to be the A, and this one to be the B, If we just compare these two, okay, if we just compare these two, mm -hmm. this one is a 50 kilogram, this is a 40 kilogram, and they have the same body in. What about the boil force? But the, but the 40 kilograms has more boil, boil force, correct? The 40 kilogram has more what? Boil force. Boil force, force. why? The weight is less. Mm -hmm. How can you determine things will flow or sink? Density. 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 Okay. Uh, what about the force that we we just talked about? You have some answer? Well, it's like the soda can that we did last week. Yes. Yeah. It's like what? The soda, the soda can. can. The, the soda, soda can. can. You know, when like, when like the soda was more sugar, or sugar sink, sink, and the sugar was less, was, and the diet soda fl mostly flow. Okay, but we are looking at two things, they all in the water. A has a higher buoyant force because the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the float floating object. So would A have a higher buoyant force? Mm -hmm. So A uh, is greater than B because it has a more weight because it is equal, right? Any other answer or different from this one here? So you're talking about you guys were talking about the the, the so weight, it right? Yeah. It has more of the weight, and they have the same volume. And so you also agree that A is greater than B. Any other answer or any other uh, things that you want to comment to this, uh, the, the result of these two? I don't, I don't think it's right, but I feel like if I put, say, something in the tub and they all have the same volume, regardless of where they are in the water, mm -hmm. they're still displacing the same amount of water. Mm -hmm. So then that makes me think that they're all the same. Okay, so what you're saying is they should be the same because they displace the same amount of water because right. they have the same body. Yeah. Any other, any other, like uh, opinion or or comments about this or any other thinking that you have? 
Okay, so, well, we have like two different scenarios over here. So one uh, group of people think that A has a higher buoyancy force than the B, and the other is that, could that be the equal? It's not going to be the other way around. Um, so if we think about this problem, and you, if you look at uh, Archimedes' principle, which is actually a guideline to help you to understand how much of the buoyant force is, because it's a harder to measure the buoyant force. You can weigh things on the scale, you can get the weight of the object, right? So you can get the number right away. To figure out the buoyant force, the best way is actually you put the object in the water and then see how much water actually overflow from the tank and the tank is full. And so if, if they, they have the same volume, if we base on the Archimedes principle, they should have the same volume force. Okay, they should have the same volume force. But, but what happens if one is more weight and one is less weight? What does that tell you the more weight and less weight means? I think, what, yeah. I think it means that maybe the those that have like the same weight, like 50 kilograms of liquidity, have like the same um, buoyant force, but maybe 40 does not. Although, yes, they have volume, but weight is also a factor when displacing the liquids. Yeah. So you, you're, uh, I think your you're, you're, uh, reasoning is, is, is okay. It's a, it's correct, like this one, if we draw the force of the wave, the direction of the wave is going downwards, right? So this one has a wave going downwards. This one also has a wave going downwards, but it's less than this one here. Let me make that more exact. So this is a 50 kilogram of a wave, this is a 40 kilogram of a wave. Which tells you the buoyant force is going to be the same for both cases. So let me just make this one like this. This one also like this. Okay. So this one here and this one here, they are the same because they have the same volume based on Archimedes theory. This one has a more weight, it should be have a more of the downward force. This one has the last of the weight, will have the last of the downward force. Um, if they float, which uh, you made a good point that they are, they should equal if they are floating, right? If they stand still, it doesn't move, then that it will be the case they are equal. I didn't say it's going to be just like a standstill in the water. If you start with the 50 kilograms in this case, if this one is flowing in the water, it doesn't move, then what happened to this one? It will move down. That means because your buoyant force is equal to the weight, which is equal to the 40 kilogram of the weight, then this will also have the 40 kilogram of the floating force going upwards, but you have more of the weight on this block, which means this one will overcome this flowing force, it will make it sink in. It's not sink to the bottom yet, but it's in the process of sinking to the bottom. So then it's like A equals like C? Well, that A equal to C, eventually A will be acting like a C. Okay. Yeah. But so the, the correct answer to just answering the point of force is that, that the same volume that you have to think about, the point of force is based on the Archimedes principle that are always, always going to be equal to the volume being displaced. And because they have the same volume, so their point of force will be equal. Okay. Now, will this one has the same buoyant force as this one, or different? Again, this one, A and C. Which one has the larger buoyant force or the same? They have the same. The same. But eventually we'll see A is going to Yeah. 
There, the point force is going to be the same because the point force depends on only the volume of the water to be displaced. So when it, it's, a, it's a in the process go to the sea, but it's like the sinking to the bottom. Okay. So it's sinking to the bottom. It's, it's actually in the process of going down to the water. Okay. If I make another case, which is this one here. It displaces more. It displaces part of the water here. And what will be the point force of this one? of this one is 50 kilograms. Yeah, but the reason why the other one sank was because when you drop the 40, it balances with that. So that's why the other two sink. But like that one's um, there, so it's not sinking. It's not sinking. Yeah, it's not sinking. It's floating on top of the water. Then you look at our rule over here. <laughs> what happens if things is a float? Weight is equal to the void force. That means the 50 kilogram is going to give you a certain so amount of force. Area has more force. It just have a larger volume, well, but but if you measure this much amount of the volume, it's going to be the volume force, which will be 50 kilogram. Meaning this amount of the water you weigh it is going to be 50 kilogram of the force. That's why it keeps flowing. That's why it's float. Um, so, so does the red arrow represent the weight? Wait, wait, yes. All right. So, if this is a flow and the point force has to be equal to the weight, and how much of the weight this is, is going to be equal to this much of water if you weight it. This flow, we know density of this one is less than the water, right? So it, it has a larger volume, um, and it's going to flow. Okay. Is it okay? So with with the ship example, right? That makes me think of the cargo ship, right? Yeah. And then you have the volume of water that's displaced. That would equal the weight of the sh the buoyant force would equal the weight. The the. Okay, so think about this. <laughs> <laughs> we have. Does it matter how much weight is under the water? That's what I'm wondering. Or is it? Uh, or is it does just it a matter how much weight? You mean the ship or the, like the block? Yeah, like so. Say like with that volume, right? Mm -hmm. Is it the whole thing is fifty? So regardless of how much of it is under the water, the buoyant force is still fifty. Yeah, still okay. fifty. Yeah. Um, so it's so if what happened if I add more weight on top of this, it's going to sink more. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I add another ten kilogram, it's going to decrease another ten kilogram of water, uh -huh. and that's that's how this is working in this case. Um, so if you think about like the submarine, what well, a submarine is made of like steel, right? It's very heavy, but how can the submarine Still flow to the top of the water because the submarine is like a like an empty box, right? You're not like this like the whole steel of the submarine. The shell is made of the steel, but the inside is just like a water. It's just like air, right? Just an air. If if submarine wanted to sink, then how can a submarine sink? By putting more weight. You put more weight, and how do you get more weight? Suck in the water. You suck in the seawater. So, so you suck in some of the seawater to make it more heavier, and it will sink. Now the submarine has a fixed volume, right? So the buoyant force, when it is in the water, 
The buoyant force is the set. If you stick more, if you got more of the seawater, you may be heavier, you will start sinking. And as if you expel the water out of the ship, of the, of the submarine, it will start to float. That's how the submarine is controlling where it is sinking or is it floating. It's like by the propeller then? Like the propeller is move is make it move like horizontally, right? But up and down is controlled by the rotation, like the oh. volume force and the weight. Okay, so that's summary. What about sh fish? Oh, these are gills. Mm -hmm. The the so the fish, unlike the summary, the summary is made of the steel. It cannot change its shape, so the shape is the same. The volume is going to be the same. And to make, so it's also related to the density. So the density, so the density is depends on the volume and also the mass or the weight. If you cannot change the volume and you can change the, the weight, right? By changing the weight, more of the weight, more of the density if the volume is the same, right? Same among like this. If this is heavier, meaning it has a higher density, so it will sink. Well, the fish is more like the demo that I show you, the plastic bag in the bottle, it can change its body, and like the fish can actually change its body. Mm -hmm. So it has the same amount of a mass, the fish is not gonna change its mass, and then you can control the body by uh, getting more of the body and then you can float. So it, they control by that way. So it's different from the summary. Okay. All right, so this uh, this is a hard to understand, but this is a, a kind of an important idea about the float and the sink and based on these two. Okay. Questions about this topic? Yes. Sorry. So the point is, is that if it displaces more, it'll have more buoyant forces. If it displaces less, Will most it, well, out. I won't say it will sink. Is that it has a less of a buoyant force. Okay. Yeah. You can you can have a very light object, it will float, mm -hmm. but uh, it doesn't mean it's going to sink, right? Okay. Or it, it just meaning the buoyant force is smaller. It's more than the weight. So when you float, the buoyant force is more than the weight of the object. It's equal. It's equal. It's equal. It's equal. Yeah. And when it sinks, the, um, the weight is greater than the, um, the buoyant force. Yes, yes. When it sinks, there's a weight going down, which is greater than the buoyant force going up. That's why you sink to the to the ground. Is there a case where it stays in the middle, like in the 40 kilogram? Because the 40 kilogram is equal to the buoyant force, right? Good, good. So, when this thing is floating, <laughs> is it possible that an object floating in the water it doesn't move? It is possible if this one has the same density as the water. I can, we can control it. If you have a bottle like this, and I can change the weight of this bottle by putting more or less of the object in the bottle, if I make it seal, then when I feel just enough of the object inside of this tank, you will have the same density like water. Even though there's not water, then Wherever you put in the tank, it will stay there. Yeah, they see water bottles that people throw in the pool. They stay in the middle. They don't sink. Yeah, yeah. Stay so yeah, you control how much water, how much water they put in there. Yeah. yeah. But ideally, it should be like the same density. Yeah. But ideally, it should be like the same water because uh, this plastic is not going to have a lot of uh, weight. Yes. Yeah. The water with the same density because this water doesn't have the same density as the sea water. Well, sea water has more density. More density, yeah. This one doesn't have. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. Um, any question about this? No. It's an interesting topic. It's, uh, sometimes it's a hard to believe, but this is a good one. Okay, I don't know if you know this, but how much of the volume on a submarine is actually used just for bringing in more water? Uh, so, the, so a submarine only have like a fixed amount, uh -huh. right? So. But I mean, like, how much of it? How much is that it required to make it yes. sink? Um, percentage of it. <laughs> um, percentage. I, I, I don't know, but um, 
you have to do some calculation. Yeah. So yeah, uh, steel is much heavier. Um, so I, I would guess probably you take like 20 or 30% of the water in, then you, you can make it sink. You just have, you just need like a little bit more than the floating force, it will sink, okay. right? And you have more of the way, just make it sink in faster. All right, um, I'm gonna move on to the next topic, which is about the, the, the heat and, and temperature. This uh, is the... All these centers are there like relative to the uh, All the what? The A is greater than B because where and how are they all true? Like, is there a good answer or no? If I ask about the boiling force, this is the correct answer. Okay. Uh, but there's nothing wrong to say weight is equal to the boiling force when it's a float. It's yeah. yeah, but this has to be like it doesn't move. If it doesn't move, if I say it doesn't move, then this is also going to be correct. Yeah. Okay. But in this case, it's actually. What about when you said because water, weight is larger? A to A greater than whatever. Than yeah, so the way it's larger is simply the same like uh, this one here. Okay. Because um, this meaning, this is a sinking. This is like a, it's flowing in, yes. yeah. so in the water. Yeah, so this is a flow in the water. This is a sinking in the water. This, this the is uh, the same volume. It should have the same weight. Got it, got it, thank you. Great discussion. Um, any more questions about this? <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about another interesting topic. So, um, uh, let me give you some basic idea about like uh, the temperature and the heat. You probably is, like I'm crazy. What do you want to talk about temperature? What is temperature? So, what is temperature? Anyway? How do we define a temperature? How would you define a temperature? The measure of heat. The measure of heat. Any other definition for the temperature? If I ask you one question in the exam, what is temperature? How are you going to answer it? What is the temperature right now? It's 50 or 60 Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, probably. You measure Fahrenheit, right? I measure, well, I, I get used to the Celsius. Celsius, the I'm used to Celsius too. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's Let's say, uh, uh, what is the measure? Let's say this is a, like a 72 Fahrenheit. Right, if I ask you what is the temperature right now, well, you look at the thermometer, but you still have a thermometer over here. And you can read the reading, and you can tell what the temperature is, right? It gives you a number. Mm -hmm. So one simple way most of people use for the temperature is you can use a standard measure to tell how warm or how cold the, the temperature is, right? How, how cold or how warm using a standard um, scale to tell us what the temperature is. So that's the basic idea of what people would use. Now why do we need a number? Because that number give you a comparison that you can kind of feeling, well, if I tell you 50, then what does the 50 mean? It's just a number. If you say 50 is in Fahrenheit as opposed to 50 in Celsius, it's totally different. 50 Fahrenheit, probably you feel cold. The 50 Celsius is going to kill you. <laughs> So it's totally different. So when you talk about temperature, you also have to tell me what is the unit that you use, okay? We have two different 
uh, unisystem in the world. This is the state. Uh, if you use uh, Celsius, this is the, the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I just first come to the States, I, I'm not getting used to the Fahrenheit. I don't know how to convert it. Um, but, but my point is, you have to tell people what unit that you're using. Okay. Um, but we, we, we have more of a different kind of way to measure temperature. This is not the only two scale that you can use. If you learn chemistry, you're going to hear another unit that we use for the temperature, which is a degree of K. K meaning is Kelvin. Kelvin, we don't put a degree, it's just a Kelvin, like how much of the Kelvin. This is, a, this is what we call the absolute uh, unit for the temperature. Um, so if you got a cerometer and uh, some of the cerometer will give you like two different scale, like one is Celsius, one is Fahrenheit, because most of the world you can use two different units. Uh, if this is a degree of Celsius, this is a degree of Fahrenheit, and normally for the Celsius, it will start from zero degree. Uh, the zero degree meaning the, a temperature, that temperature is very special temperature, is the freezing point of the water. This one is the freezing point. What is the freezing point for water in Fahrenheit? Minus. 32. It's not minus, it's 32. Okay, it's 32, believe it or not. Uh, for water, uh, if, you, you, if you cook the water and it will start boiling, mm -hmm. and that temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. And for Fahrenheit is what? Isn't it like 220 or 180? I think it's 232. Is it 232? Yeah. It's 212. 212. Yeah, it's 212. <laughs> okay. So, these two, if you look at the difference, so the, this is a boiling point. This is a freezing point. Boiling point, freezing point uh, is about water. The difference of the degree from the freezing to, to the boiling of this one is a hundred difference. Okay, and so the reservoir, like the decimal, so everything divided by ten is great. We only have 10 fingers, we don't have like 12 or 16 fingers, so it's easy to count. Um, so, 100 scale of difference, then you can tell the degree of uh, Celsius. This one has 180, there's nothing wrong about the 180. 180 actually gives you more precise difference, like one degree of the Fahrenheit difference has a more, like it has more sensitive to the degree of the Celsius, right? So it gives you more like a precise difference of the temperature. Uh, so people like to use Fahrenheit, it's going to have 180 degree difference from the freezing to the boiling point. Okay, so that's one way we measure the temperature. Now, how, why do people define temperature based on water? Can you think of any reason why don't we choose different material? Why don't we choose like oil or, or any kind of other things? Isn't it like easier to measure? What? Like easier to measure water? Yes, you got a right answer because everybody can get water all around the world. 
we all can get water and it's easy to get water to measure the temperature. So we all agree to use the, the water to be, you know, to define the, the degree zero to 100, which is easy to measure. Now, that's the first definition of temperature I wanted to use. But in the physics, we do things a little bit different. We are not going to define temperature in that way. We're going to define temperature in another way. There's nothing wrong with this way to define temperature, but there's another way to define temperature. Um, so this has to go to how would you feel temperature? Um, and we have to think about like more like a microscopically, which means if you look into like small particle in the air, and you feel things is hot or cold was because the air is hot or cold, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, why was things to be hotter or colder? The, actually, what happened is all these air particles, they say this is one of the air particles. Do you think the air particle in the air, like a standstill, just fixed at that point, doesn't move at all? It's not, actually it's moving, it's constant moving. It's actually always moving. Uh, if there's no motion, then there's going to be a very, very low temperature. Um, so as long as you give some temperature to this particle, it will start to move. And when it moves, occasionally it's going to hit on your skin. When it hit on your skin, this one moves it means that this one has a, a kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is something related to things is moving. So this one has some kind of kinetic energy. When it hits to you, it will transfer the energy to your skin and you're gonna feel the temperature from this particle. So like when it's fall, like when it's windy, you can feel like that's what you mean by the air particle? Uh, you feel windy, it's a little bit different than you also has you also have the another like a heat transfer get involved. Not only not only like the temperature that you feel. Okay, uh, we will talk about that a little bit after this. But that's a good point. Actually, heat transfer is another important topic we're going to discuss. But one of my points is that if you have a higher temperature and lower temperature, that's simply meaning the air particle is moving faster or slower. If you make air to be harder, the particle is moving like this, then colder is moving like this. And when it's moving faster, you get heat, you get the, the bump from the air particle more, you feel hotter. And that's the, and it actually is the energy transfer to your skin. That's how you feel is hot. So the way we define temperature is this. Okay, so microscopically, what we define temperature is we look at the particle, what is the average translational kinetic energy per particle? Let me explain what those means. The air particle, the air surrounding us has like a median or median of the air particle. It's not possible to say each one of them moving in the same way, even they are the same temperature. So they move randomly. And because they move randomly, I cannot like uh, specifically say this particle is moving that speed, that particle moving that speed, so we look at the average. So some of them moving faster, some of them moving slower. So we only look at the average. The translational meaning the motion is going along the line. It's not going like a rotation or going up and down. It's only going along the line, so it's is like bumping this way, that way, and it's just going straight, okay? It could go any direction, but it's going straight. So that's the, what the translational is. So average 
translational kind of energy per particle because you have so many particles, we only take the average of that. That's how we define the, the temperature. Now I wanted to link this one to this unit over here. When the, the chemistry or physics people define temperature, they define a Kelvin, is if you define a Kelvin, there's a Kelvin zero, which is way below here, this is a zero of the Kelvin. That number is approximately equal to negative 273 degree of Celsius. This is a sand, sand scale. If you look at the Celsius and negative 273 Celsius is equivalent to the zero Kelvin. The zero Kelvin meaning air particle doesn't move. And that is the zero Kelvin means. It's what we call the absolute zero. Even air particle doesn't move at all. <laughs> so all the particle doesn't have any of the kind of energy. It just stops. Everything is freeze. And that's what we define as the Kelvin zero. Okay. Can we find a place to have the Kelvin equal to zero? We can. Even in the South Pole, it's going to be higher than the Kelvin zero. Um, because it's going to be make everything freeze. It's not possible to find a place in the world uh, in on Earth, there's no place it's going to reach to uh, zero Kelvin so far. Even in the lab, we cannot create this kind of temperature. Zero Kelvin? Zero Kelvin? No. no. Okay. So, uh, so that's uh, how we define temperature. I I wanted you to think about this. Then, uh, so if we look. Um, so, okay, so let me ask you one question. Like, uh, if I say the temperature in this room right now is 72, okay? When this temperature is 72, meaning uh, there is um, there is a rule to to see how this temperature is flowing. Like, if you have a higher temperature, it always going to flow to the low temperature. Okay. How do you know? Well, what is the body temperature in normal condition? 98.6 Fahrenheit, okay? And the room temperature is 72, right? So the room temperature should be colder than, than the human being, right? If this is 72 and this is the room temperature, if you put two objects in the room and the room is 72, the object will slowly, slowly will reach to 72 as well. They will reach to the balance. If this one is hotter, it will release the heat and it will get to 72. If it's colder, it will gain some of the heat from the air, it will go to the 72, right? That's like the one nature rule that we know. So if that is the true, then this desk is going to be 72. This bar over here is going to be 72, right? All human being is 98. I want to ask you to do this. Use your hand to touch your chair, the plastic part of the chair, and can you feel the chair is colder? Yes? A little bit. A little bit? All right, in your chair, you also have the metal part. Use your hand to touch to the metal part and feel that. It's even colder, but I just tell you, if I put things in the room and put it, this chair has been there forever, now the temperature of that, the whole chair should be the same as the room temperature. Actually, no, I think maybe because like people sit on it, they, although everyone has the same body temperature, maybe because like people move, I guess that kind of makes a difference of the chair temperature. And like the door is open as well, so that releases some air. 
Okay, but it, the release some air, but the, the I mean the chair is here. I mean the whole thing is here, right? It, it's not like a partial of the things is outside and the partial of the inside. And people move, yes, it's going to change the temperature a little bit, it's not going to change it a lot. It will vary the temperature of the room temperature, but it's not this thing supposedly and actually is the same temperature. But how come that you feel different? Is it because of different materials that reaches in that temperature? Because of different material, they feel different temperature? Is it, diff is it more difficult for them to reach the room temperature? It's harder for it to reach to the room temperature. But if I put this to the, to the wood and also the metal in this room for a couple of days, should that be the same temperature eventually? eventually? Yeah, eventually it should be the same temperature, right? Okay, so they have the same temperature, but you make the point that they are different material. The different material will make difference because if you touch different things, you feel different. So what does the different material tell you? What is the difference between the metal and the wood? The absorption of the temperature. The density. Uh, with the density related to the temperature, density is defined by the volume and mass. It has nothing to do with the temperature, right? So, what else can we think of? They certainly they have a different density, but it's nothing to do with our You were trying to say something, or someone? Does it have internal energy or internal? Internal energy. Wow, that's another one. Um, it's what? I'm sorry. Is this the chapter? Is this chapter fifteen? Uh, chapter fifteen. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, chapter 15 is about the uh, heat and temperature. Yeah. Okay. Internal temperature, internal, I will explain what internal. So internal energy meaning this. Uh, any object has some kind of energy. And all this, air, all this object is made of atom. And as I said, atom is moving, constant moving. So. You cannot see it, but this, uh, the, 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 the particle inside of this object is moving. And how fast the, the object is moving represents the temperature. So it has a temperature, and that temperature is related to the internal energy. Higher of the temperature, meaning higher of the internal energy. The lower is going to be low internal energy. So all object has internal energy. Unless you reach to zero Kelvin, then it will be a zero energy. All objects have the same internal energy. No, because all objects depend on temperature. Internal energy depends on the temperature. Certainly, amount also matter. If you have a more amount, you're going to have more of the energy. If you have less amount, you have less energy. Higher temperature has a higher internal energy. Lower temperature is a lower internal energy. All right. So, what else difference between these two? Object. If you wanted to cook something, well, it's not possible. We're going to use the wood uh, pan, right? There's no wood pan. But if you use a like a fork and you wanted to stir like a very hot uh, wood, and you can use a steel spoon, you can use a wood spoon, right? The heat. You feel temperature more faster using a steel If you use spoon. a plastic spoon to, to mix it, mm -hmm. it'll reach the temperature more. It'll heat up faster. Ste the plastic? Plastic. Yeah, well, compared to plastic, what? Plastic compared to what? Compared to what? What was the question? I was asking if you wanted to stir uh, like a hot 
pot and pour it with uh, like a wood spoon or using a metal spoon, which one will that you feel the temperature early, like faster? The metal. The metal, right? Everybody agree with metal. Because metal has one like property will make you feel it's going to raise the temperature faster. That is actually, it's a better conductor as opposed to the wood, right? So, even though the wood and the metal has the same temperature, and we have a higher temperature, if you have a higher temperature, meaning your internal energy will flow to the colder internal energy object. The high temperature will flow to the low temperature. Energy is going to flow from you to the object that you touch. But how fast it will transfer, it depends on conductivity. The metal has a better conductivity. That's why you feel it's colder. It's actually not colder. It's the heat is flowing faster than the heat is flowing to the wood. Now, I keep on using heat. I haven't defined heat yet. So heat has a very important uh, idea. The heat Heat is energy in motion. Itself is not energy. Heat is energy moving from one place to another. It's, itself is not energy. It's, it's energy actually moving. It's not energy itself. Okay. So you cannot say this object has a heat. No, it has internal energy. It has an energy, but it's not has a heat. The object doesn't have a heat, but if you have two objects touch with each other, there is going to be a heat transfer from one place to another. And that is the heat that we define. <coughs> so even though we use heat, we probably think, well, heat is the same as the energy, or probably you think heat is the same as the temperature. They are not the same thing in, in physics, we define this uh, heat is actually the energy in motion. Okay, it's not the energy itself. What's the funny? <laughs> okay, so uh, so that is uh, one thing uh, we want to define first. We define temperature in two different ways. You can use a scale to measure how hot or how cold an object is by using some standard scale. You can use Celsius, you can use Fahrenheit, or another way to define that is the average transla translational kind of energy per particle. Okay, so that's two things that we just defined. Now, um, the next thing I wanted to talk about in this topic is um, Compare the internal energy and also compare about the heat and also compare about the temperature to just clarify that you understand this idea. So, I have a tank of water, a very big tank. I also have a small cup of coffee Um, this tank of water, I put a cerameter over here, and then give me like a 70 degree Fahrenheit. This cup of hot water, uh, hot coffee here, and I measure that, and that give me like a 200 Fahrenheit. Okay, which one has a higher temperature? Simple, right? A cup of coffee has a higher temperature. Which one has a heat? An object doesn't have a heat. So, 
But like it sets as a thermometer, doesn't it like translate something at least? Because you're putting two objects next like on it, you know. And that's why you said heat was only for transfer. Obviously probably the thermometer has no heat, but like it has internal energy. And so therefore doesn't it have heat? You you uh you're right. There is a heat happening. <laughs> I, I'm, so, I, I think we're, we're saying different things. If you look at the water and the cerometer, and there's an interaction between these two, right? There is a heat happening. Let's say, if I got a cerometer, and when you pick a cerometer from this room, mm -hmm. what will be the temperature of the cerometer it shows you? It's going to be the room temperature. Let's say the room temperature is 72, mm -hmm. the cerometer will have 72. Mm -hmm. Now, water normally will be colder than this. Let me just say, if the water is, if this water is 60 degree Fahrenheit, and my cerometer is actually starting from 72, I put the cerometer in here, what happens to this reading? It's like slow. It's going to drop, right? Mm -hmm. If it drops, that means the internal energy of the cerometer will be will dropping or decrease, right? And so why would internal energy drop? Because energy flow to the water. The internal energy of this one is going to move. And that's what we call the heat. There's a heat going on between the cerometer and the surrounding area. And that's what we call heat. But the object itself doesn't have a heat. It has internal energy. This one has internal energy. This water has internal energy. And things happen in between is what we call the heat. It's an energy in motion. It's moving from cerometer to the water. I put cerometer over here, then what do you expect? What do you expect from the coffee and the cerometer? They interact. This one will increase the temperature, meaning the internal energy will increase. Mm -hmm. And where is the internal energy increase from? Mm -hmm. It's from this coffee. The coffee has a high internal energy, right? And so then you think about how we measure temperature. So you then you go back to how we define temperature. If I put this one into a hot coffee, the hot coffee has the particles moving really, really fast. It's going to hit on the cerometer and it's going to transfer the energy to the cerometer. The cerometer is going to gain the energy and it's going to get a higher reading. That's how energy is actually transferred. Energy can be transferred with a different form and this form is from kinetic energy to internal energy. Okay? So, higher temperature, lower temperature. We all agree, right? No heat in coffee. There's no heat in the water. There is a heat transfer between the cerometer to the water. Heat transfer between the cerometer and the coffee. Okay, which one has a higher internal energy? Is the water or the coffee? The coffee. Coffee? Because? It has more of what? It's, it's, it's in a more container, it's more... It's more temperature is higher. Temperature is higher, so we say internal energy just depends on the temperature. Yeah. The water has more atoms, right? There's more, so that it has more internal energy. Yeah, so you also have to look at the mass. So more of the mole also have more of the energy. So internal energy depends on two things. This one is likely to have a more internal energy because the amount of this tank of water is way larger than the small cup of coffee. 
even though these are the high temperature, but the, in the total energy also has to depend on the amount. You have to multiply with the amount. So if you, um, what do you call those, like, uh, um, like a bar, and then, you know, if you light it up, and it's going to uh, give you like a spark, like fire spark, something like that? Mm -hmm. Sparkler or something? Flickler? Flickler. Okay, Flickler. So I went to, uh, so a few years ago, I went to Hawaii to uh, attend a, a wedding. Uh, at the end of the wedding, so the groom and they just walk with this nice dress, and then they and they ask the guests to line up with the, uh, and they give the give us this flickers. So with the lighting on the flickers, and they just passing you, I was kind of afraid. Was that going to burn fire on the, on the like wedding dress? You know, like it's very expensive, right? Um, would you be afraid if you light this up and you just use your hand by the, the flickers? Yes. When it hits on you, what do you feel? Pain. You probably feel a little bit pain, but it's not like a very painful, right? How high the temperature of this is? This could go up to almost like a like couple hundred degrees Celsius. So it's a very high temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over there now. It's because it's a metal. So you want to make, make the metal, metal to melt, you have to be higher temperature. It's way, way higher than uh, 200 Fahrenheit. It's, it will be probably reached to 1,000 Fahrenheit. But it's not going to kill you because it, even though it has a higher temperature, but it doesn't have a higher energy because the amount of those things is very, very small. So even though it has a higher temperature, it doesn't mean it has a higher internal energy. The it's energy- not like, It's not like if you're welding with the welding sticks, but that has a greater, greater temperature. You yeah, know, it, the welding it, stuff. Mm -hmm. The you welding know. that you look at how much amount of that. Amount, right? And that, if that goes to your body, that burns your body, but that thing, Body, but it's less. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a less. It there. probably, you still going to feel it, but uh -huh. it's, unless there's like a big chunk of that uh, touch to your unless, skin, yeah, otherwise yeah. You, you won't feel like a very Maybe because it's really well, but that, that, that's really, really, really gets on your skin because you're doing metal, you know? Right. right. All right, so that, that is the, uh, so one of the comparison that I wanted you to understand. I haven't covered it yet, but um, okay. Um, before the end of this lecture, I want to give you one idea that we will continue this, this discussion next time. Water is such a nice thing. So we use water all the time, and water has a very, very good property. Uh, that property we're going to discuss is called this. Uh, specific heat capacity. You probably never heard about this before, and the way to think about this is, this is related to how fast or how slow uh, things can change its temperature. If this number is larger, uh, that means you you will be harder to to raise the temperature. If this number is smaller, it's easier to change the temperature of the object. 
to give you an example, like if you wanted to use a, um, if you want to heat up something, then you will prefer to use a metal pen, right? And we have a, a, tons of different kind of metal that you can choose. Uh, some people like to use those like a copper um, cookware. Mm -hmm. Those are mo normally like more expensive. Uh, and you can also choose like aluminum, you can also choose the steel, and uh, copper has a higher conductivity, also it has a, a smaller specific heat capacity. Uh, so what does that mean? That means if you want to, to raise the temperature of the copper, you need less of the energy to make a change. If you wanted to change the, the energy of the temperature of that water, you need more of the energy to change it. It's harder to change the temperature of the water as opposed to change the temperature of the metal. So just compare these two, uh, the metal has a smaller specific heat capacity, but water has a very high specific heat capacity. As a matter of fact, water probably is the highest heat capacity in the world. It has because of this property, um, we have the, the nicest, we have such a nice weather in California, it's all because of the water. Uh, we're running out of time, so next time when we meet, we will tell you why the water is so important, why water actually regulating the temperature surrounding uh, us, and uh, it's so important that we use water all the time. Okay, um, if, you, if you give me back your uh, Scantron, I finished recording already, you can take it back. If you didn't give me last time, you can come over and just give it to me. Then I will. Hey, I haven't got my video yeah. back. Uh, I know. So. I was waiting for it. Yeah.